at one o'clock. I have two things to do. This is the first one. Elder Clark said, you got to talk about Ellen White. And, and is, does anybody know who, who she is? You heard her name before? Let me, let me speak a word as well about just all that has happened this morning already. I've been blessed by our study, blessed by Sister Sierra and that gift of music. Lord have mercy. That was tremendous. Uh, thank God for his people and how he gifts them. I've got to talk to you this morning about Ellen White. Now, I, I, I made a, a variation of this presentation earlier, and I, I have a recurring nightmare, as I told the, the leaders of the church, that I'm going to walk into a church one day, and, and I'm going to say the name Ellen White, and somebody's going to say, Ellen, who? Who is that? Or she will be swept up in so much controversy and so many issues that people will forget who she is. I came to tell you this morning, I spend an awful lot of time in her writings and the, and the Word of God. And I can tell you, don't ever give up what God has given you. Don't sleep on the blessing of God's prophetic revelation. It would be a huge mistake. And I'm going to make that case today that it's a mistake. I'm going to go a little fast. So please forgive me. I'm going to try to skirt through this thing as quick as I can. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 29, the Apostle Paul says this. I know this, that after my departure, after I leave, ravening wood, savage wolves will come among you to not sparing the flock. He says, once certain people leave, other people come. And some of those people who come are not the best people. Do I need to mention the name Jim Jones to you? Surely this soil ought to know what false prophets look like. I remember that man back when I was a child that he took, he took out of this soil almost a thousand people. False prophets that show up calling themselves prophets, but, but they, they're more like P-R-O-F-I-T-S, not, not, not the regular kind. Prophets who profit off of people's pain and misery and their longings. What is prophecy? The Bible says that prophecy is really just messages from God. Um, in the Old Testament, there's a word that's used for it. That word is nabi. And that word means a speaker or proclaimer of the truth. The word Nabi can also mean prophetic speech. Uh, anything that comes from God. It is stuff that, that you can't come up with by yourself. Things that God reveals are prophecy. Now, here's the thing. Prophecy always lines up with previous prophecy. So that which God reveals always lines up with his word. So those people who show up talking about they got new light. And they bringing you some new darkness. Uh, you you, you, you got to turn on the light on them. Turn on the scripture on them. If they speak not according to the law and the testimony, Isaiah 8, 20 and 20 says, there is no light in them. So it is critical that we have the Bible's filter working. All the time when people come with prophetic speech. Can't you see? God is no respecter of persons. I'm here to tell you today, he is calling all kinds of people. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10 that he called a little boy. Little boy sleeping and God would come to him at night. And Eli said to him, when he comes, say, speak, Lord. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Speak, Lord, for what? Ah, thy servant heareth. You know what's interesting about that thing? That little boy is serving God and trying to, to, to follow God while his older uh, Eli's sons, them older boys, are doing nothing but evil all around him. And the Lord still comes to him. I came to tell somebody in Burbese, I don't care what's happening around you. You can be faithful. You can stand for God. And God can speak to you even while... You know, Hophni and Phineas are doing what Hophni and Phineas do. No uncertain terms. The prophetic revelation of God doesn't have to be in places where things are perfect. In fact, God reveals himself often in places where things are not perfect, where things are not perfect. Uh, prophets receive instruction from God, and they pass it on to the people. And when a prophet gets a message from God, some of them pull a, pull a, um, a, a, a you know, some of them, like Jonah, get in a boat and try to run. But I'm here to tell you, you can run as far as you want to run. When God calls you, he will find you on the boat. And anybody going to talk to me this morning, he will find you on the boat, cause a storm, and make them throw you overboard. When the Lord calls you, beloved, the best thing to do is what that little child say, here I am, Lord, come on. 
Send me, Lord, I'm willing. Speak to me. Uh, uh, Moses tried to tell the Lord, Lord, I know you're calling me, but I can't speak. I, I, I stutter. I, I, have a, I have a speech impediment problem. I can't speak, Lord. And the Bible says that the Lord said to him, I will put my words in your mouth. And then you put the words in Aaron's mouth. And I will be to you and Aaron a mouth. What God was saying is, you're not getting out of my revelation just because you can't talk. That's a word for somebody today who believes that they could get away from what God has called them to do simply because they have some personal problem. God is making no uncertain terms to his servant. You can find this in Exodus chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. The Bible says, God says to him, I put my hand on you. You don't get to refuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm calling you. When you see in the Bible, you see priests and you see prophets. Priests represent the people before God. Priests take the people to God. And priests wear, you know, they, they got the breastplate and they got the 12 uh, stones on it that, that, that represent the nation. They take the people before God. Prophets bring God to the people. Prophets bring God to the people. And usually because the people are doing something that is not of God. So God says, I've got to send a prophet. I've got to intercept them. God has always been doing this thing. This is God's raison d'etre. This is God's modus operandi. This is what God does. When my people get off course, I come to them. I don't throw them away. I don't let go of them. I come to them. Prophets uh, can be rendered in two ways. Some are proclaimers. Prophets, prophecy can be proclamation or prediction. Some people think that all prophets must predict. No, some prophets proclaim. For instance, Moses is a proclaimer. John the Baptist is a proclaimer. But then you have those that handle predictions, such as Daniel and John the Revelator. Those are prophets that predict. God has always sent prophecy to clarify truth. And he did it himself. When Adam and Eve sinned, beloved, they didn't just mess up all of creation. They also broke face-to-face -face communion with God. Come on, talk to me, somebody. All of a sudden, God couldn't show up to them. The fire of his presence would consume them. Now, you know when people get do bad things, and they make us mad. What do we do? We stay away from them. The Bible says God came to them. That's a lesson now. God leans into the problem. He doesn't run from the problem. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 3 and verse 9 that God spoke, and then in Exodus 20, God wrote, and then Amos 3 and verse 7, God does nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3 and verse 7, Deuteronomy 29, 29, what is revealed to us is for our benefit and our edification upon whom the ends of the world will come. God has been speaking, beloved, and God is still speaking. I'm going to say it again. God has been speaking and God is still speaking. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says he's doing it in these last days by his son. Revealing things to us because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should what? Come on, somebody. Come to repentance. God doesn't want to lose anyone. Has God gone silent? You know, sometimes I put my phone on silent when I don't want to talk to nobody. Has God put his revelation on silent? Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. I'm coming to something. Stick with me. Joel 2. We start with the Bible first. We don't go to Ellen White first. We start with the Bible first. Uh, uh, the Bible says in, in Joel 2 and verse 28, I will pour out my spirit on some of the flesh and, and only the sons, not the daughters, only the sons will prophesy. And, and only young men, because old men can dream dreams, only young men will see visions. Is that what the Bible says? No, the Lord says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Male and female flesh. Young and old flesh. And at the end of time, God is not going to keep his revelation hidden. Not when the stakes are so high. If, if, if a sister is willing to serve the Lord, the Lord will use her. If a brother is willing, the Lord will use him. If a child is willing, the Lord will use him. Whosoever will, let them come. The first time in the economy of Israel do we see this whosoever. Jesus says whosoever will, let them come. He that cometh unto me, I will in. Oh, y'all know the Bible here. All right. Amen. We know that this prophecy of Joel chapter 2 was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. We see the Holy Spirit coming down like a rushing mighty wind. They were all filled, Acts 2 verse 4, filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. All throughout time, God has been speaking. Listen to this. Watch this now. When, when, when humanity failed, God came down himself. 
all right? When the flood, when we were ripe for destruction in the flood, he sent Noah, prophet. When uh, God's people were in Egyptian captivity, he raises up Moses. When they get into deep apostasy under Jezebel and Ahab, I'm going to talk about them later, he raises up Elijah. When they are in exile, he raises up Daniel. And in fact, before the second coming of, the first coming of Jesus, he raises up John the Baptist. Are you with me? Now, if he's done that all through time, why before his second coming would he not raise up a prophet? When the stakes are high now, in fact, in the, in, at the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve sinned, and when the world is ripe for destruction under, uh, destruction under Noah, destruction we are ripe for now in this world. Men and women are captive to all kinds of things. There is apostasy in the land. There is exile in the land. There is formalism. That's what was predominantly practiced during the time of John the Baptist. People would, would go through a form of the religion, but having absolutely no power. They come to church, but they can't change nobody. They look good on the outside, but they messed up on the inside. Formalism. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I'm talking to me. People who look good, but don't do good. No power. Formalism. All of those things are resident in our world today. And why do you think Jesus would go through, God would go through all that trouble, but all of a sudden he would not call a prophet? No, I believe before the second coming of Jesus, he would call a prophet because the revelation of God is not capped. It is not ended. It has not ended. We believe, beloved, in the proceeding word of God. Man does not live by every word of uh, that, man does by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. We believe in the proceeding word of God, that God's revelation is not stopped. It has not stopped. All of these things are parallels of where we are. I told the saints earlier this week that I wish I could show you this picture of, of, a, of a tower of, of a, a nest of cables on a pole. The world has over 40,000 Christian religions. How do we determine whose truth is really true without the revelation of God? Everybody is claiming that their truth is true. The Bible talks about one faith, one baptism, one Lord. Whatever happened to that? The only way to understand, beloved, where, where, whom God is speaking to and whom God is speaking through is if he prophetically reveals to us what is true and what is not. Amen? That's why we've got to know for sure that we are in tune with God, that when he speaks, the Holy Spirit can confirm or disconfirm that which is not of God. So God's beautiful picture of unity we see in Acts chapter 2. The brethren broke bread. They came together. They had all things common. If you had need, you could trust the brothers to supply your need and the sisters to supply your need. Amen? That's the picture of unity that God wants for his church. And God wants this unified body of truth to once again exalt his truth before the second coming of Jesus. Why? Because people are dying without truth going to Christless graves, and God is calling us to be lights in this dark world for them. Amen? Seventh-day Adventists believe that one of those people who was called is one Ellen G. White, that God put his finger on her and gave her a revelation of, of who he was. Ellen White had over 2,000 visions. 2,000 visions she had, and those visions she claimed came from God. How do we know so? Well, we ought to subject her to the test. It was called test of a prophet. Does she speak according to the law and to the testimony? Ellen White has over 77,000 biblical references in her writing. There is no other author even close. She has over 30. That's, 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 that's test number one. Test number one. Does she speak according to scripture? Yes. Test number two. Does she accept and, and, and support the deity of Christ, that, that she exalts Christ. Well, Ellen White not only exalts Christ, but our understanding of Jesus as a deity, as a figure, as God himself, our understanding of the Trinity in the 1890s came from Ellen White's study of the scripture. The book Desire of Ages, page 530, in him was life unborrowed, underived. 
all throughout her writings, the deity of Christ. Another test of that is what's called the fruit test, the orchard test. What is the fruit of the person's life? Did this person live the life of a prophet? Well, I, I don't have to tell you what I think. I think she did. I know, I know her life. But, but when Ellen White died, newspapers around the United States printed uh, obituaries of her life. And you should read some of those. They commented about the fact that this woman did the work of a worthy prophet. She accepted no filthy lucre and gain. That's what secular papers said about her and her life. Ellen White wasn't much to look at. Five foot two, hair brown, eyes blue gray, favorite food tomatoes, favorite color pink. Favorite flower, red rose. Favorite text, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. Find it all over her writing, celebrating what Jesus has done. But that little lady with the third grade education is an amazing person. Ellen White is amazing even if we didn't say it. Even if the Adventists give her up, I'm here to tell you, people are discovering Ellen White like you will not believe. So the White Estate, where I work, has Ellen White's writings online in over 94 different languages. We are watching something that we can't even explain right now. Every month, every month, over 10 million people come to our website to download Ellen White's writings. Every month, we have over 120 to 140 million digital interactions around Ellen White's content. So while Adventists, some Adventists, are giving up Ellen White, a whole lot of people around this globe are discovering Ellen White. I'm here to tell you, God is doing amazing things. That Revelation 18 angel, the one that lights up the world with the glory of God, is lighting up the world, Elder Bowman, with the glory of God. That those writings are doing amazing things. She wrote over 100,000 pages and 50,000 uh, manuscript pages. I could go down the list. No other author has written on as many subjects as Ellen White. She's almost by herself in that regard. She is the most translated, I'm telling you this for a reason, she is the most translated female writer in history. This is Ellen White. Ellen White is the most translated American author of either gender. Steps to Christ, her most famous book and the one that's most, that's most circulated, Steps to Christ is ov in over 190 different languages around the world. Steps to Christ by itself. Ellen White is amazing historically. In fact, the Smithsonian Institution in the United States voted Ellen White the ninth most influential religious figure in American history. That's not an Adventist institution. I'm talking about what God has given this church that we are somehow sleeping on. This Bible. Why do we need Ellen White if we got the Bible? Well, Ellen White says we don't. I don't know if you know that. She said, she said, Life Sketches, page 1, 198, she says this, if you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain a Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. It's Ellen White now. She's saying, if you were studying the scripture, you, you won't need the Bible. I mean, you, you won't need my writings. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourselves with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by direct, simple testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you have neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with its pure, elevated teachings. So what Ellen White is really is a prophet to Scripture. She's a person who's pushing God's people back to the Word of God, and she's saying, if you study and read the Word of God like you should, the Lord wouldn't have needed to send me. But because you have not, he wants to give you strong medicine to get you back to the word. Ellen White says, you know, I, I, I didn't choose this career. I have felt for years that if I could have my choice and please God as well, I would rather die than have a vision. For every vision places me on the great responsibility to bear testimonies of reproof and warning, which has ever been against my feelings. Ellen White is a lot like Jeremiah. In scripture, you know Jeremiah, that weeping prophet, young boy says, Lord, I can't even talk. Don't, 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 don't choose me. But when you read her writings around Jeremiah, she says the Lord chose him because of the softness of his temperament. Because God, he could feel the Lord's pain. 
Lord says, you're the one. The rest of them are so hardened in heart, they can't even feel what I'm going through. I choose you, Jeremiah. Lord does amazing things to try to get his people's attention. He says to Hosea, marry a prostitute. Because that's how my people have acted. You see the extent to which God will go sometimes to get a revelation to his people that they might be saved? Hard thing for us to understand. Ellen White was anti-slavery. She told one man who was, who was a, a racist supporter of the American Revolution from the South, she told that man, your views of slavery cannot harmonize with the sacred important truths for this time. You must yield your views or the truth. Both cannot be cherished in the same heart. You must not have fellowship with God's church. This is a leader of the church. She told the church, put him out. I could tell you more. That's Ellen White. Ellen White was a human messenger. Ellen White buried two children. Ellen White felt the guilt, beloved, of leaving her children with other people while she was doing ministry. We have her letters in pain over the challenge of doing God's work when your children are not with you. She buried two children one of which could have been saved if she had known some things that she learned later in life. This person we call Ellen White is a very human, human minister. But the thing I love about her is she is so committed to the word of God. She says, in the Bible is the will of God revealed to his children wherever it is read, in the family circle, in the school, or in the, in the church. All should give quiet, devout attention as if God were speaking himself. A prophet to scripture. Whenever somebody attempted to put Ellen White's writings above the Bible, she corrected them. Listen to this. Brother Jay, this is a Brother Jay who, who thought that her writings were an addition to the scripture. Beloved, don't quote people Ellen White before you give them some scripture. I, I, I've seen it a little too many times where, where we will beat people with the little books. We will, we will beat them into submission. I have a quote. I have a quote but can't quote scripture or can't lead people in the scripture. This is a problem. We must be balanced Christians who are first people of the book. Brother Jay would confuse the mind by seeking to make it appear that the light God has given through the testimonies, that is our writings, is an addition to the word of God. But it is, in this, he presents the matter in a false light. God has seen fit in this matter to bring the minds of the people to his word. To give them a clearer understanding of it. The testimonies, the writings of Ellen White, this is her again, are not to belittle the word of God, but to exalt it and attract minds to it that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. Never are we to exalt it. Our position of faith, evangelism, page 256, our position of faith is in the Bible, and never do we want any soul to bring in the testimonies. My writings. Now, one of the things that we challenge, we're challenged with in the Seventh-day Adventist church are critics of Ellen White. And we have people who read Ellen White and think that they have the truth. And then they're going to come and tell everybody else what they're supposed to do in the church. Do we have anybody like that in Burbese who want to uh, control the church, purify the church, save the church? God has spoken to them at night after a very big meal. And they are... They are having a revelation from the Lord. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And they come and they want to tell the church what they are supposed to do. Beloved, I came to tell you this morning, there is nothing new under the sun. In Ellen White's day, there was a gifted preacher by the name of Dudley Marvin Canwright, who was an absolutely gifted man of God. When he came to the truth, uh, Canwright left the church three times. Between 1873, 1883, after 1883, he labored for a while, and then 1886 and there beyond, he left for good. But his story is a study in what happens, thank you, is a study in what happens with critics. Dudley Canwright said to people, um, that, you know, I would be a great preacher if it wasn't for this church. Exalted opinion of himself, exalted opinion of his ability, and then one of the other preachers had to tell them, Elder Canwright, um, it's, it's actually the message that made you. You didn't make the message. There are those of us among us who claim 
to have some light that God did not give. And I came to tell you this morning, I wish I had more time. I came to tell you, beloved, be very, very careful about how you handle God's prophetic writings. Be balanced. In fact, you know, there's a powerful scripture in the Bible where Jesus, you know, the, the scribe comes to Jesus and Jesus asks him, what's, what's, what's written in the law? And the scribe says, Lord, this is, this is the thing. Um, you know, to love you with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says to him, scribe, you are not far from the kingdom. Because you understand that love is the principal thing. Often what I see in my church is that critics lack the love of Christ. They lack the spirit of Christ. It's okay to disagree with things in the word. It's okay. We will never have, Ellen White writes this, we will never have uniformity of understanding. Everybody won't understand everything, but the spirit in which we disagree matters, and, the, and we must always be people who continue to support the unity of God's church and do not tear it down. She makes very clear in her writings, the church is not Babylon, the church is not apostasy, and you should not raise your voice against God's church. His organization of this church is sacred to him. The first rule of heaven, said somebody, is organization. God is an organized God. And these levels of this church and the way this church is laid out was brought down to us in vision. God is a God of order. Well, let me, let me give you some quick principles and then I'm going to sit down. I've only got about two or three minutes left. And I want to give you, I want to give you some quick principles, beloved, so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a way to read Ellen White's writings. Number one, number one, first principle, when you approach Ellen White's writings, pray. Start with an attitude of faith rather than an attitude of doubt. Are you hearing me, beloved? Don't approach revelation, not in the word or the scripture. Spiritual things are, thank you. They require the Holy Spirit's guidance for us to be able to understand the things of God. In fact, if you read the scripture very carefully in the writings of Paul, Paul says that the carnal mind can't even receive the things of God. The things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. We need God, amen? Number two, the second thing I want you to know is, beloved, when you approach the writings, stay in the center of the council. What am I saying? If you stay always trying to find some edgy thing that Ellen White said, what happens to you is you fall off the edge. Edgy people who live on the edge fall off the edge. You inevitably will move into fanaticism if you don't read across her counsel. Sometimes Ellen White would say something that seems absolutely, you know, in stone, and then that passage will be moderated by another passage. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Ellen White says, never, never should any of our schools be erected in the city. Never. Now, you can't get any more stronger than never, can you? Never. But if that's the only statement you read from Ellen White, you would be mistaken about her counsel about education. Because at another time, she said this. A little bit later, she said, this issue came up and they came to Ellen White. Didn't you say never, no school should ever be erected in the city? It should all be in the country? Then she said, beloved, if God has children in the city that need to be saved who can't get out to the, to the country, use your common sense. This is literally her writings. Use your common sense. God is not willing that children be lost simply because we can't serve them. Build the school. Listen to me now. This is, this is point number three. There is a difference between the ideal and the real. Ellen White places her strongest statements when she's talking about the ideal. The ideal is raise children in school, in the country, if you can, away from the influences of the city. But if you don't have that opportunity and the, the circumstances change, do what is best for the moment. Balanced, balanced. Let me also say, beloved, read across her counsel. Don't just take little parts of it and, and, and run off with that. There's something else Ellen White had a problem with, and that's with people changing what she said. Family of God, try not to twist her words. In fact, she writes in, in the book, Selected Messages, book two, she says that sometimes I don't recognize what people say that I said. 
They have so twisted and changed what I have said that I don't even recognize what it is that they say that I said. So Ellen White is telling us, don't rest, change my things to make them fit what you want me to say. All right, final point, final point, last point. Then I'm going to say one story and I'm going to go. Final point, Ellen White um, says in, in, in one, of the, one of the hermeneutical principles for, for understanding and reading her writings is to understand time and place. Context matters. So one time Ellen White said, no saint should buy a bicycle. Nobody should buy a bicycle. Now, is there something evil about bicycles? No, I don't think there's anything evil. About, if, if it was evil, um, my father would be in hell right now because when we were in this country, he rode a bicycle. Now, it, the issue was not the bicycle. The issue was the cost of the bicycle. People were spending as much as two and three months wages to purchase a bicycle. And taking money that belonged to God and spending it on frivolous things. Ellen White was saying we ought to be good stewards of God's resources. And therefore, don't spend money on things that you don't need while you're robbing God of what he needs to do his work. Ellen White was giving us great principles. There are many others I could give you. But I want to tell you this, that Ellen White was a person who received messages from God, and these messages uh, were things that she could not have known during her lifetime. I told the saints this, this one thing about the Ten Commandments, and I want to share it with you, then I'm going to stop. Ellen White says in the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are ten promises, and that there's nothing negative in the Ten Commandments. She wrote that in 1898. And scholars have discovered that Ellen White was right, and that's only been in the last few years. So what, does she, what do I want to write telling you? The, the Ten Commandments, when you read them, it's thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not. And if you read it, it sounds negative. Don't, 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 right? Sounds negative. But beloved, where did the Ten Commandments begin? Where? Who, who said it? I, I, I am, where, where does it start? I am the Lord thy God. That's where the Ten Commandments start. But traditionally, people believe it starts with thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? That's how we master it there. But if you start it there, it sounds negative. Scholars have discovered something in the original language of the Ten Commandments, the original uh, uh, language of the Bible. The Ten Commandments can be rendered two ways. Thou shalt not or you will not. Thou shalt not or you will not. If you started at thou shalt have no other gods before me, then thou shalt not is the, is, is the primary force of that statement. But if you start the Ten Commandments where my brother just mentioned, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, I'm the one who, who brought you out. Uh, what the Bible is really saying, and this is the correct understanding when the scholars have discovered, they only recently discovered it. This is the correct understanding because I have brought you out of Egypt, and I am your God, and I will put my sanctuary in the middle of you, and I will put my spirit in you and cause you to follow my ways, you will not steal, and you will not commit adultery, and you will keep the Sabbath, and you will not covet. The Bible is telling us an understanding, beloved, that Ellen White had over a hundred plus years before scholars discovered it. There is not a negative in those commandments. And there is no way she could have known that except that God revealed it to her. Family of God, I just came to tell you this morning in this first little section here, we have a powerful revelation from the Lord. Read it, but keep it in its right context. Scripture first. God first. Lesser light pointing to the, the greater light. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this privilege of sharing just a little bit about these wonderful writings. Lord, it is a trust, a sacred trust that you have given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but it's not just for us. It's for people everywhere who want to know you and want to know what is to come in this world. So God, help us to handle it with care, but help us also to live the truth we know and to share it with this world. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Let all the Burbese people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.